Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Um, I want to thank Joel and Rebecca for inviting me here at this very important event for me. I think for everyone here. Um, I also want to acknowledge here uh, the most intimidating digital clock I've ever seen in my life <laughs> in any speaking venue in the back. <laughs> I find it perversely ironic that an event for Chris Marker would house one of the most intimidating time-telling machines ever made <laughs> to remind us all how little time we have to say what we want to say about anything. <laughs> so with that in mind, I'm just going to, um, I'll start. A couple weeks after Chris died, uh, the great, great film and video venue in Brooklyn, Light Industry, had an all-day screening event uh, dedicated to Chris. It started at 10 in the morning, and um, each was introduced by uh, another artist or a scholar or a writer. Martha was there. Martha introduced. What did you introduce, Martha? Letter to Siberia. Um, I was grateful to have been asked to introduce the last Bolshevik. So it went from 10 until like midnight or something. Uh, but um, in the morning, when people started to, when people showed up for the first screening, um, they were met with this which was an impromptu, I assume impromptu, I don't know. A sidewalk memorial showed up next to Light Industry uh, to uh, pay tribute to Chris. And so it was there all day, and uh, people had a chance to light candles and to bring flowers and whatnot. What I liked about it when I showed up at Light Industry for my intro was that someone had took the time to paint and make owl heads on the cats. Uh, combining the two animals that I think Chris was famous for uh, liking, the cat and the owl. And it was seeing this sidewalk memorial that I realized that maybe at some point, maybe soon, that I should write down what I think about Chris. Um, but of course, life goes on. You have emails to check. You have ba bills to pay. You have things to do, and you forget about it. And, and I completely forgot about it until Rebecca actually said that you guys were doing this event, um, which made me think that maybe I should finally write the fucker down. So um, I wrote the fucker down. In October of 2010, I emailed Chris to ask if he was interested in taking part in a special issue of EFLUX Journal that the art critic Sven Ludekin and I were editing. The issue focused on whether contemporary art had or had not addressed the rise of right-wing populism in Europe, the US, and elsewhere, and how these largely nationalistic, homophobic, and xenophobic movements impacted culture and art. With the ascendancy of the Tea Party, Sven and I wondered whether it was possible to chart a genealogy of right-wing groups on both sides of the Atlantic and to illuminate their familial relations. Anything would do, I, asked, I wrote Chris, a piece of text, an image, even an animated GIF. I had invited him to participate or take part in other things before, but, he ne but it never worked out. Surely, I thought, Chris would have something interesting thing to say about this. He did. Two months later, he replied. Hi, Paul. Sorry for the delay. I couldn't have met the deadline anyway. At an age when normal people care for the eternal salvation or go fishing, which is not incompatible, I have managed um, to put on my shoulders more daily work than I've ever had in my life. But I gave it a lot of thought to your proposal, and sadly, I must say that it doesn't make any real sense. For yes, I'm sorry to have to say this, the Tea Party movement is an isolated event. There's a mixture of bigotry, crass ignorance, and estrangement from any rational thinking that is unique in the world and as idiosyncratically American as country music or Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> True, there are in Europe movements that are nationalistic, homo uh, xenophobic, etc., and we're watching their rise with concern. But none of them fits the ideological vacuum of the Tea Partiers. Characters like Sarah Palin or Glenn Beck are just as unimaginable in Europe's politics. In France, the most dangerous leader of the extreme right, Le Pen, is a cultured man 
who can debate geopolitical issues on the same level as his opponents. The shroud of religiosity that wraps the whole TP movement and US politics at large is something unknown here, where the split between church and state is the cornerstone of the republic. Unthinkable to hear a public personality pronounce, quote, so help me God. Even, when, even racism has different roots. It relates here to the colonial empire and the Algerian war, not slavery and Jim Crow. And its expressions are strongly controlled. I saw plates and badges depicting Obama as a monkey with a banana. Anyone who would dare use such imagery here would be severely punished by law. And as if for the main topic of the TPs, the traditional American defiance against central government, it's in complete contradiction to, with the European extreme rightist movements, who without exception are in favor of a stronger state. I can go on and on like this on practically every characteristic. So the only possible comparison would be at the lowest levels. All are evil, all are included, uh, and all include an impressive number of morons. <laughs> Not much for food, methinks. Sorry for this long explanation of my own inability to participate. All that representing only my private views, of course, and no intent on discouraging anyone to push the comparisons deeper and surely better. But well, all I could do was a frank response. Best wishes anyway for the coming year, the year of the cat. <laughs> Sharp and generous, that was uh, even when he's, all he's saying is no. That was Chris, and he made a strong case. There were essential differences between the Tea Party and say the National Front in France or the Party of Freedom in the Netherlands. What Sven and I thought as a chance for artists and thinkers to grapple with a transcontinental phenomenon that emerged in part because of the global recession of 2008 was for Chris a fundamental misreading of the political situation. The incisiveness of his critique made his declining to take part even more stinging. My only consolation was that he was at least wrong about one thing. 2011 was the year of the rabbit on the Chinese zodiac, <laughs> not the cat. I thought Chris's famous affection for all things feline had clouded his astrological senses. As it turned out, he wasn't wrong about this either. 2011 was the year of the cat on the Vietnamese cat zodiac. The contours that define a life are shaped as much by what one does not do or turns down as what one agrees to or ends up doing. Bartleby is an extreme example. Duchamp's retirement from art making is as admired now as the art that he actually made. A case can be made that Samuel Beckett's major works amount to a resounding and insistent no, to perhaps the most famous yes in literature, the one which ends James Joyce's Ulysses. The road not taken leads elsewhere. This insight is available only if one is willing to entertain the possibility that saying yes does not guarantee advancement or gain and that refusing to go along with something or someone is not necessarily a kind of loss. For what is lost is often nothing more than an illusion to begin with. A renunciation is at its heart an act of disenchantment. It breaks the spell cast by what gain promises and holds up like a carrot. By not going along with the program, one is able to see a more essential reality, that a carrot is usually a stick. The ways in which Chris refused to go along to get along, like his insistence on not being photographed or interviewed, are as legendary as his accomplishments. It is, not ironic, it is ironic, to say the least, that someone so adept at making media should also be so phobic of it. But what I imagined as a personal quirk deepened into what I eventually realized was a crucial aspect of Chris that illuminated his work in relations to his life in and out of media. This realization came about after my student days as I began making work for myself and sometimes for others, but always with the idea that the work ought to align with or serve what I considered to be a greater political good. It was then that I began to realize something about media. It is fundamentally a medium for glory. To express is already in a sense to acclaim. Why would anyone spend the time and energy to compose with words or notes or images if not because, for whatever reason, one believes they convey enough of what one thinks and feels to be worthy of attention, even praise? Media is what is made of this acclamative dimension of expression 
when it is used to either build a public or influence one. Media glorifies what is expressed for those who want and need a public's praise in order to establish or maintain the authority one seeks to more ably shape that same public in the image of what that authority considers good and true. The power of media to glorify whatever it is expressed through it is media's essential political character. Or to put it in vulgar Benjaminian terms, glory is the aura of media. This is certainly why, without necessarily using these terms, I made videos with and about the new labor movement in the 90s instead of paintings or interactive online works on behalf of, of anti-globalization groups post Seattle 99 instead of sculptures. Media acts as the stage where authority of all kinds is claimed and praised, even the authority to criticize authorities. I think Chris was remarkably sensitive to all this. F film, photography, and other reproducible forms of media expression have been characterized, at least since Benjamin, as the means with the power to free art from its aura of tradition and authority, uh, authenticity, which enables it to motivate a revolutionary transformation of the masses. But as far as I can tell, no clear evidence exists that justifies the idea that media is what public art for a coming, more progressive society is supposed to look like. On the contrary, it seems self-evident today that media has no elective affinity beyond that which longs for glory as the power and right of authority, whatever the political orientation. Chris was, I think, someone who believed that the progress of political and historical thinking is interdependent on the development of new and emerging media forms. He placed what little faith he openly expressed in how the fate of each is bound to the other, like real lovers or genuine dialectics. And in terms of understanding the sociality at the heart of all forms of expressions, he was just as imaginative and cunning about organizing, collaborating, producing, distributing, and networking lives around what was made as an element in the work itself. In short, he lived and worked what Benjamin only hoped for. It would not surprise anyone for me to say Chris believed in the emancipatory potential of media. But I also want to suggest that he disdained the glorifying aspects of it. This is why I think he made so much compelling media while being so adamant about not being in it. Politics, for those who want to live and breathe it, is not merely something one practices. It's something one develops from within, like a style. Perhaps it was not enough for Chris to only make work that expanded the terrain of a certain set of political and social ideals. He also had to inhabit a way of being in the world that was, for all intents and purposes, anti-authoritarian. His persistent need to anonymize and depersonalize himself and the thoroughly heterodox nature of his body of work are, flip, are like flip sides of the same coin. They both reflect someone who refuses to take on any form of authority. One of the most telling things about artists and poets with a real anti-authoritarian streak is how their work tends to eschew the easy graces of established habits of expression, the tried and true. They compose forms that flaunt their irreconcilabilities, typically surprising and unpredictable as personalities. These kinds of artists invite change and contingency as collaborators, which renders the work with a spirit that seems incapable or unwilling to cohere into resembling anything finished or completed. They manifest process in an instant. They exude a protean nature. This is what makes the work feel new. It's as if they've been made to exist beyond the means of their own compositions. This is not a matter of aesthetic ambition. It is the understanding of something more basic and human, all too human, that we need to see and feel the presentness of our situation beyond who or what we think we are in order to remember what we actually need to meet what the day demands. For if it is anything, the new is a radical reminder of what is really worth renewing. It certainly all felt new to me. The first time I encountered Chris's work was in 1994, when I watched The Last Bolshevik in a nearly empty theater. So new was it that I fell asleep. 
half an hour into the video when the Odessa step sequence came up, I couldn't keep my eyes open any longer and nodded off. I woke up some time later and seeing that it was still on, I closed my eyes again until nearly the very end. It was not that I was bored. Rather, it was that I couldn't take in anymore the way in which the work was historical, lyrical, critical, funny, erotic, rigorous, generous, angry, and resilient at the same time. It had never occurred to me that it was possible to do that within a single composition. The signal was too strong, the frequency too high. I just shut down. This is probably more indicative of my lack of a real aesthetic and intellectual education than anything else. Since then, however, it has still been nearly impossible to find work that so deftly careens in and out of so many modes of emotional and discursive experiences while resisting at every turn becoming something that could easily be categorized. What is the last Bolshevik really? Or for that matter, Sans Soleil, or In Memory, or 2084, or Level 5, or his expeditions in Second Life? What is it all supposed to be about exactly? I can imagine him laughing. As far as I'm concerned, laughter is the most philosophical of our reflexes. It's what happens when our body tries to reconcile with contradictions. Chris's work feels that way to me, even when it wasn't necessarily funny, but especially when it was. During the heydays of Occupy, many of us received this from him. This is, this is, of course, a riff off an incident at the University of California, Davis, on November 11, 2011. During a peaceful Occupy demonstration, a campus police officer began indiscriminately and nonchalantly pepper spraying students on a sidewalk. A video documenting what happened was uploaded and immediately went viral, and Chris wanted in on the action. This image was followed by others. Is that a word? <laughs> it's hidden. <it. laughs> I don't know what's going on here. I appreciate these on so many levels. They are engaged but deeply goofy, like what any teenager with a budding political awareness and a pirated copy of Photoshop would make. But this is also what makes them strangely intimate like many of his best works, there's an amateur or craft-like quality about them, whether it is his use of consumer-grade equipment or the handheld aesthetic or the anachronistic visual effects he employs. They evoke the feel of someone who's trying to make sense of what one can with what one's got on hand. It is, in fact, how humble they are as minor interventions into the public digital consciousness that makes them pleasurable and surprising. This is Chris Marker, after all. Why is he making pepper spray cop memes? <laughs> it wasn't all he made. A month earlier, while Zuccotti Square in New York was still occupied, Arun Gupta, a journalist and activist I used to crew with during the height of the anti-globalization movement, was getting people involved in what eventually became known as the Occupied Wall Street Journal. It was a free broadsheet published and distributed by Occupy volunteers. Arun asked me to get artists to contribute to a special poster edition of the journal, which would be used as visuals in upcoming marches and protests. I naturally asked Chris, not really expecting a response. He, smiled, he emailed me back an hour later with this. I passed it on to Josh McPhee, an artist who was designing the issue. A few weeks later, the paper came out. Chris's graphic mixed it up among works by anarchist collectives in Barcelona and Brooklyn, poster makers from Oakland, and gallery artists from New York, which is to say he fit right in. A few weeks after, another artist sent me some images from an occupied demonstration in New York's Lincoln Center.
The man speaking in the middle was Philip Glass, who took time during the premiere of his own opera at the Met to speak a few words in solidarity with the demonstrators. It was a real coup for the organizers who staged the protest. But what really quickened the heart for me was this. The protesters were indeed using Chris's graphic. Chris saw the picture later online and wrote me, quote, too happy to be, even from afar, somehow part of it. Happy times when, as soon as I heard of a march on the, Washington, on the Pentagon, I just had to jump on the first flight, unquote. We know, what we, we know what he means, don't we? We learned it from him. In an age when the practice of a certain kind of politics means merely refining one's critique in a classroom or symposium. His work reminded us real thinking had to be done on one's feet, out there, where the people and the histories are most tense and contradictory, which is to say, most alive. How many have been inspired by him to take their work on the road, in the streets, and in the midst of it all, so that they could find out for themselves what it's like to fight and win and lose for a future worth imagining? I can safely say, at the very least, one. Baghdad before the Second Gulf War, Detroit during the New Labor Movement, the countless boring and violent Republican and National Presidential Conventions, the Vieques Independence Movement in Puerto Rico, New Orleans. He dared me to. I heard on the radio once an interview with jazz great Wayne Shorter. He was 79 and was promoting his new album. He was asked if it was hard teaching young musicians the classical structures of jazz. He laughed and then replied, jazz shouldn't have any mandates. Jazz is not supposed to be something that's required to sound like jazz. To me, the, the word jazz means I dare you. So much has been made about the grand themes that ground Chris's work, time, mortality, memory, history, politics, that it is easy to mix, mistake them as the telos of the work, as if his oeuvre was nothing but an extended meditation on, say, what memory means. This is understandable. But why go to such lengths to blur so many distinctions of form and content to create unclassifiable works that simply end up pontificating on the same dreary conventional themes that seem only to haunt the minds of the intellectually narrow-minded? If there is something that captures the spirit of what Chris has made over the course of his life, I think it is expressed in the phrase, I dare you. This is what comes to mind every time I see his work. I swear I hear it whispered under every breath of every voiceover. He's saying, I dare you to be political without being didactic, lyrical without being decorative, critical without being judgmental, cunning without being cruel, funny without being flip, serious without being stiff, and curious, always curious, about how we can live with history without living in the past. In the spring of last year, Chris emailed saying he needed a favor. He was hospitalized and couldn't send images and wondered if, he could, if I could forward the photo of his Occupy poster from Lincoln Center to someone. I replied saying, of course, and if there was anything else I could do. He wrote no, and that it was the best thing anyone could do for him at the moment. He signed off by saying, bless you. For someone who has never professed any kind of faith, it surprised me to read it. I knew then something was wrong. Out of the blue, I remembered what Franz Rosenzweig once wrote. Prayer awakens the man in man. Two months later, Chris was gone. Thanks. <laughs>